Hi, everybody. This is the Crime Cafe, your podcasting source of great crime, suspense, and thriller writing. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I introduce my guest, I'd like to remind you to please check out the Crime Cafe 9 book set and the Crime Cafe short story anthology. Both publications you can find on my website, debbiemack.com, when you click on the link Crime Cafe. And uh, you can also find the podcast subscription buttons there, as well as Crime Cafe merch. And with that, I would like to introduce my good friend and a great writer who uh, also happens to be a multi-award winning author, a retired clinical forensic psychologist, and a retired college professor, Richard Helms. Do you go by Rick or Richard? I go by Rick. Rick, Rick. yes. I always call you Rick. <laughs> so very cool, Rick. So um, uh, thanks for being here. I'm, I'm so glad you could be here. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate you having me today. Well, it's my pleasure. And at this point, you said you have 19 published novels? Well, yeah, I have 19 that have been published. Um, I think three of them are still in print. So uh, a bunch of them are available as ebooks, but uh, most, of, most of my novels right now are out of print for any of a number of reasons. Um, my own publishing company folded up back in 2011 and several of the books were on that and Five Star, I'm, I'm one of the Five Star orphans. Some of you may not be familiar with Five Star. It was, a, it was a division of Cengage Learning, which used to be Houghton Mifflin, and it was Thompson Shore and all these other, but anyway, it um, they folded their, uh, their mystery thriller line uh, January of 20, I guess 2015, um, and I got the message on my birthday that uh, my book publisher was going out of business, and not only that, but my books were going to be going out of print. So, the books that I have with Five Star are largely out of print at this point, uh, but I have had 19 published up to this point, um, beginning all the way back in 1980, which is probably before a lot of people watching this were born. Uh, when I uh, had my first couple of novels published by World Karting Magazine. I was a, I was a go-kart racer back then uh, when I was in college. And uh, Anne Bazzoli Kugler with World Karting Magazine talked me into writing a series of stories about a, a driver named Paul Geary. Um, and the two books, Geary's Year and Geary's Gold, were serialized over the course of about four years in World Karting Magazine. Um, I immediately got to work and started uh, uh, writing uh, an adult style thriller. At the time, I was really reading a lot of Robert Ludlum and Ken Follett and um, David Morrell. Uh, and so I decided I was going to write a Ludlum style thriller uh, called uh, the, uh, uh, the Valentine Profile because obviously getting published was so incredibly easy that all I had to do was dash it out and send it off and people would pay to publish it. Uh, I didn't see another book in print for almost 20 years. So. <laughs> this is not a place to look for overnight success. Well, the, 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 uh, most of the overnight successes I know have been doing this for about 20 years. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> one level or another. I mean, Praise was writing for TV for years. Uh, Lee Goldberg, too. You know, uh, people who have been slaving away in the... Uh, in the assault mines of writing, in the back rooms, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the story uh, the, the story runner rooms, you know, these are the ones, and a lot of them are now coming out as novelists and doing a really great job. So. That's correct. That's true. Uh, I was going to ask you about stock car racing, and if you'd ever considered writing a NASCAR novel. Well, I wrote a um, I wrote a uh, novella. Uh, which I is currently, I, I have a, I have a book of short stories that's currently with my new book publisher. Um, uh, it's Clay Stafford books out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, but I've sent him a, 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 a short story compilation that includes an unpublished novella that's built around stock car racing. Uh -huh. uh, 
And in the book I'm working on right now, uh, I've had a request from an agent uh, to uh, do a full read on it. Um, in the book that I'm doing right now, there's a section in which one of the characters does become a professional stock car racer and eventually a professional indie car racer uh, back in the 1950s and 60s. So, uh, so the, it peaks in from time to time, but I haven't actually written an entire book except for the karting novels built around racing itself. Hmm. Well, it would be intriguing to see more of that. <laughs> um, I, think, I, think, I think my good friend Tammy Kaler is going to kind of cornered the market on that one. <laughs> is that the woman who uh, often teams up with Simon uh, Wood? Yes, yes, they're, they're good friends. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, they're but both Simon's into racing. A racer, and Tammy's done a little bit of, I think, autocrossing and a little bit of racing. And, of course, I drove race cars for about 28 years. And so when we get together at conferences, we have something other than books to talk about. <laughs> um, you've had a number of different protagonists over the years. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, if somebody asked you what kind of books you write, can you think of a common thread or theme or type of protagonist that runs through your work? I think they all probably embody, and this is a kind of a trite, uh, it's, it's almost like a stock answer, it, it, you know, but, but really um, I think they all kind of embody the idea that Raymond Chandler talked about that down these mean streets walks a man who is not himself mean. And he goes into all the other qualities of the, uh, of the private eye writer. As Robert B. Parker pointed out in his doctoral dissertation, however, even Chandler said that this hero doesn't really exist. This is not a person you would encounter in real life because in real life, most of us have way too much to lose. Um, but, uh, you know, and that's where fiction gives us this outlet, this heroic uh, Arthurian kind of figure who, you know, or sometimes a, a chaotic kind of, uh, <laughs> of, of character who's tilting at windmills, who, who does the things that nobody else can do. Um, that would be the person that I write. Uh, I tend to write the, those individuals, the larger than life characters who embody values and ethics and morals that I believe in. Uh, but at the same time are able to take it one step further and become the, uh, the, uh, the knight's errant who can step in and, and save the day uh, when most of us might just stand by saying, what is there to do? You know? Yes, exactly. I, I, I tend to write heroic, uh, more heroic figures, I think, um, without labeling them necessarily as heroes. They, they would certainly say, I'm no hero. <laughs> uh, people around them might disagree. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, not surprisingly, I've noticed a lot of your main characters are retired forensic pathologists. Psychologists. Psychologists. Well, I noticed the, the use of the term pathologist in well, I, some of I your use descriptions. The term pathology a lot, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Pat Gallagher is, it was probably my marquee character. He's the one that's gotten me the most stuff over the years, most recognition. Um, and in fact, there's a new Pat Gallagher novel coming out this summer from Clay Stafford Books in Nashville. It's called Paid in Spades. And I'm real excited about it. Um, but uh, the Pat Gallagher is a retired forensic psychologist and a disgraced college professor. Mm -hmm. uh, What's really interesting is that when I wrote Pat Gallagher originally back in the 1980s, I, I wrote the first stories around 1980, 84, somewhere in there. Um, I was neither a forensic psychologist nor had I ever been a college professor. <laughs> so it's almost like in this case, life imitated art. Uh, that um, uh, a couple of years after I wrote the first uh, Gallagher stories, um, I went to work as the supervising psychologist in Charlotte uh, for a uh, facility, a 24-bed locked facility for the most violent and aggressive teenagers in the state. Um, and I walked in the first day, uh, and, and I had been hired as a behavior analyst, which is what I was trained to do. Uh, almost all my work up to that point had been behavior analysis rather than you know, kind of touchy feely counseling kind of stuff. So I walked into uh, the first day working for, for this uh, center 
And I walked into the director's office and he looked up and he said, ah, our forensic psychologist has arrived. And I said, whoa, time out. <laughs> I said, I'm a behavior analyst. I'm not trained to be a forensic psychologist. I don't claim to be. And there's nothing on my resume that said forensic psychologist. He said, don't worry. We're going to get you trained. And they did. They did get me trained. Um, but I was, I was very taken aback by the idea that I might actually wind up doing this stuff that Gallagher had been doing in, in my stories before. Uh, they, uh, later that day, I had my uh, first therapy session. It was a group therapy session for adolescent sex offenders. And I walked in uh, and it was being, it was being uh, conducted by the assistant director of the, of the facility, a wonderful woman named Juliet Orridge, uh, who later went back to England. She was from England. She went back to England and she was awarded the MBE, um, or no, the OBE, o Order of the British Empire, uh, for the work she did with, um, with uh, child uh, rehabilitation there. But anyway, she was, she was running the group that day. And I walked in and she looked up and said, oh, our new sex offender therapist has arrived. And I said, whoa, time out. I'm a forensic psychologist. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's how that came to be. Uh, but yeah, uh, Gallagher's retired forensic psychologist. Uh, ben Long in The Unresolved Seventh is, a, is retired, but he's dragged back in to practice in, in that particular book. Um, I think, uh, oh, Hollis Dayton, uh, who is the, the, the female heroine, uh, she's a heroine of uh, uh, The Daedalus Deception, which is a book that's only come out as an e-book so far. Uh, but she also is a retired social worker, as I recall. Um, but uh, beyond, beyond that, I'm not sure if there are any others. I, I'll have to, I have to think and, and look at some of them and find out. Uh, maybe some of the short stories. And I know Eamon Gold isn't, and, and obviously uh, Judd Wheeler isn't. And the new character, uh, I just finished a book this past December featuring a new private detective from uh, Charleston, South Carolina, named Whitlock. Uh, and he obviously, he's definitely not a retired psychologist. But yeah, Gallagher and Gallagher and Ben Long, absolutely. Uh, they, they do have that history, and, and Hollis Dayton also. And for anybody who doesn't happen to know what does a forensic psychologist do? 95% of the time they test people and write reports and, and testify in court. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while, uh, you know, we, we, we tend to have, we tend to, to uh, internalize this television image of forensic, of a forensic psychologist uh, from what we see on criminal minds uh, with Joe Mantegna or, um, or what we see uh, in um, in other TV shows, uh, CSI and things like that. Uh, in reality, the life of a forensic psychologist is largely built around uh, working with people who have already been caught and convicted. Now, there is a small select group of us um, who have had the opportunity from time to time to work actual active cases, uh, working with what we call unsubs or, uh, you know, uh, uh, unknown subjects, um, during an investigation that's ongoing, but that's really rare. Uh, the people who do that the most would be individuals who are working with the FBI's investigative support unit in Quantico, um, or, which is what criminal minds is supposed to be about. It's, it's basically that, that FBI investigative support unit. Uh, I think if you want a really good picture of it, you might instead want to take a look at the uh, series on Netflix um, about John Douglas, uh, the um, Mindhunter series. Uh, that's probably a lot more of what, if, you're, if you want to take a look at what happens in forensic work during an active investigation, that's a much better picture of, than what you're going to find in, in criminal minds. But really, for most people who, who call themselves a forensic psychologist, they're doing one of several things. They're either doing a pre uh, a pre-sentencing evaluation to assist the court in determining what would be an appropriate um, appropriate sentence for the individual who's already been convicted. They might be called in before 
or during the trial phase in order to conduct an evaluation to determine either uh, or determine whether the individual is either competent to stand trial or if there's going to be an insanity plea. They may want to, they may want to go ahead and check that. Uh, competency would involve anything from the presence of an intellectual handicap to emotional disability, to autism, to a cognitive difficulty, to, to effects of strokes or other kinds of damage to the brain. But the idea is that you want to determine whether or not that individual can understand the process that's going on in court and to uh, substantially participate in his own defense, his or her own defense. Um, that would be competency. If there's some question as to whether or not the individual at the time of the uh, crime itself uh, was capable of understanding the nature of what they were doing, uh, then that would be an insanity evaluation. Uh, insanity evaluations are much more difficult than competency evaluations because you ha basically have to go back in time uh, and try to figure out what was happening at a point that may have been two or three years ago uh, in the mind of a person who, who committed the crime. Extremely difficult to do. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that the average insanity case or insanity plea, the insanity plea is attempted in like one in every hundred cases or more or, 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 or fewer or more. Uh, and it works about 1% of the time. So mm -hmm. it might work about one time in a thousand that you try it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's just not a very popular approach by most defense attorneys. Um, but when it does happen, somebody has to evaluate the individual to determine if they were insane. And that also would be something that a forensic psychologist would be more likely to do. Some forensic psychologists are also involved in incident, um, uh, incident events, uh, such as hostage takings, uh, where they, they would not be the person who, who would be doing the actual uh, negotiating with the uh, with the hostage takers, but they may advise the the trained individual who is doing hostage negotiations uh, on what they're seeing from the the suspects: uh, anxiety, uh, depression, uh, loss of hope, things like that. Uh, there are things that that the negotiator genuinely needs to know uh, in order to do their job correctly. And a, a forensic psychologist might be involved in that in some cases. Uh, hmm. A wide range of activities, but like I say, 95% of the time, it's testing people, writing reports, and testifying in court. And that's yeah, <laughs> yeah television point. gives you lots of um, misimpressions about what people do in their jobs, and I always like to hear about what people are actually doing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, your the latest book that you're coming out with is Older Than Goodbye. Is that correct? That was that came out in 2014. Oh, uh, was okay. I'm five star novel. It was the third book in the Judd Wheeler series. Um, mm -hmm. Judd Wheeler, uh, beginning, I guess, probably right around the time I wrote the Unresolved Seventh. No, even earlier than that. Probably uh, uh, the end of the first decade of the century. Um, I started writing more about North Carolina, where I live. My previous series had been set in places like New Orleans and San Francisco and places like that. Uh, beginning with the Judd Wheeler series, Six Mile Creek, the first book in that series, I decided I wanted to narrow my, uh, narrow my range a little bit and focus on an area of the country that I know very, very well. In fact, Prosperity, North Carolina, the, uh, the setting for the Judd Wheeler novels, uh, and for a number of other stories that I've written, also involving other protagonists, um, uh, there looked very much like uh, a town that I lived in, in North Carolina, about 17 miles outside Charlotte, uh, because I was very familiar with that area. So I used the, the, topo the topography and the, the, uh, the demographics and all that of the town that I lived in and just renamed it Prosperity. Uh, I renamed the county. I was in, in Union County, South uh, North Carolina, uh, and I renamed it Bliss County. I renamed the county seat from Monroe to Morgan. And, uh, and everybody who lives in this area, uh, I, I do a lot of book clubs in the area, and uh, they'll ask me, you know, 
uh, what is prosperity? Is prosperity Waxhaw? Is it Mineral Springs? Is it Marvin? You know, wh where where is where is uh, uh, is prosperity? And I said, no, prosperity is uh, is uh, Weddington. Uh, Morgan is a uh, Monroe, uh, you know, uh, Tulip Springs and Michael Wells or this and this. And, and they say, oh, and, and I can see it now. I see it in the books because I drive these highways and these streets all the time. Uh, and uh, so, so I really focused much more on North Carolina um, and narrow, and like I said, narrowed my, my geographic focus enough so that uh, it's almost as if Bliss County after a number of short stories and novels and, and all that uh, is becoming kind of my uh, Yachna Potiphar County, you know, that uh, uh -huh. Faulkner had uh, based all of his stories in. And I like that. I, I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying writing about the area of the country that I grew up in that I know best. And I was going to say you chose a sheriff this time as opposed to a private eye. Police chief. Police, police chief. chief. Yeah, that's it. Police yeah. chief. Uh, well, let's I had see. the choice of that protagonist. He's a police chief uh, in a small town. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a an English or an English teacher girlfriend. Uh, he has a skinny um, uh, patrol officer that works with him. Uh, this is beginning to sound a lot, something very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Andy of Mayberry. You know, gone, I was going to say. Uh, gone, gone very, uh, very, very badly. Uh, so imagine a Mayberry where you've got Russian drug dealers and, and, and internet prostitutes and murders and everything else. And, and you've got pretty much the Judd Wheeler series. I love it. <laughs> I didn't realize it until after I'd done the first book. And I, I went back I was re and I was reading it and I said, this all seems very familiar somehow, and, and it's, 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 mm. of course, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 skinny patrol officer uh, Slim Tackett is anything but Barney Fife. He's probably the best cop in the county, uh, and very very dangerous if, if left to his own devices. Um, and and Wheeler is, is supposed to be the the, the sagacious, uh, the uh, well read, the college educated, but down homey kind of police chief. And in fact, he's a very very damaged human being. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot there's a lot uh, different than Andy and Mayberry, but the, the the feel is there, and the zeitgeist of Mayberry. Uh, at least a bizarro world kind of Mayberry exists in these these uh, these Chud Wheeler novels. Uh, so yeah, and 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 as a matter of fact, the book that I'm working on right now uh, that is going to a an agent in California. Um, she recently requested a full read, but the book that I'm working on right now is a prequel to the Judd Wheeler series. It takes place in Prosperity and in Bliss County between 1954 and 1989. And one of the characters in there is, in fact, Judd Wheeler's father. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's built much more around the, the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and all the social changes that took place between the 50s and the 80s. Um, but it uses the characters in the setting from, uh, from my modern day uh, Judd Wheeler series. And that, was that, sound, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, the, the, t the working title is A Kind and Savage Place. Hmm. Um, and I think we see both sides of the, this uh, very, very uh, uh, small town in the course of the story. So. Interesting. And um, I've been reading your book, uh, The Mojito Coast, which was a, um, I believe, a Seamus winner or a a nominee. Winner. Nominated for Best Novel in 2014. That's uh, awesome. That's one that year. So. And um, that takes place in Cuba in the right. 1950s. Yeah, right that's a the, fascinating, interesting time. It takes place right on the in eve place. of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, as a matter of fact, during the Cuban Revolution itself, uh, the, the climax of the book uh, uh, takes place after Castro and his buddies have marched into Havana. Um, and uh, all hell's breaking loose, and uh, uh, there's panic in the streets, and and uh, and the the protagonist, uh, a fellow named Cormac Lum, a private eye from uh, from 
Miami, uh, is has to get his uh, the woman he went to go find in Havana. He has to get her out of the country, but also at the same time he has to get his uh, his girlfriend out of the country. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's fascinating time, and 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 the research on that book was almost as long as the book. I think the book itself ran about. It was a short novel. I think it ran about uh, seventy thousand words, and I think the research that went along with it ran to over 150,000 <laughs> words. Uh, just stuff I pulled down off the internet and articles, from newspaper articles from the 50s and all that, uh, and talking about how what life was like in Havana uh, during the uh, Batista regime and shortly after the revolution itself. And I love that uh, Ernest Hemingway makes a uh, short appearance in the novel. Oh, he's a big part of it. He's, he's, he's <laughs> character uh and he, he shows up off, off and on all the way through it uh Hemingway's always been one of my favorite literary characters and I, I really wanted to include him if I was going to write about Havana during the revolution Hemingway was a natural uh, <laughs> thought that he had he had to play a part in it I, I tell you a secret about that book interesting story about that book for years I dreamed that I had written a private eye novel set in Cuba during the revolution, but I couldn't find it. I'd misplaced it somewhere. I'd written it, I'd written it and I'd printed out the manuscript and I uh, had hidden it somewhere. And in my dreams, I was going through closets and going through, through, uh, cabinets and going through suitcases, looking anywhere I could, you know, blanket chest, trying to find this manuscript for this novel I'd written and never could find it until one night I dreamed that I found the manuscript finally and I started reading it. And of course, you know what happens when you try and read in your dreams, you know, the, the words start rolling off the page and, <laughs> you know, dissolving into goo and dripping onto the floor and all that. But I was very fortunate in that in my dream, I started living the story that was in the novel that I had supposedly written and then misplaced. And it was that dream that provided it. It, it didn't. The dream I had didn't look a great look a great deal like the book that was finally written, but it gave me the bare bones for the story. Wow. Uh, so this really, this story, I joke about this a lot, but this story really was the stuff that dreams are made of. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so, or the story made out of dreams, something like that. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to have to wrap up pretty soon, but is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we finish? Very much. I have here, we're doing a little giveaway here as yes. part of this presentation today. Um, I was, I was the guest of honor at uh, Murder in Magic City in Birmingham, Alabama a couple of weeks ago. And in order to ensure, because so many of my books are out of print, I was very concerned that I would be guest of honor at a, at a, uh, at a, at a conference where there were no books to be signed. So... <laughs> Uh, but I did go ahead and take three of my short stories. Uh, these are uh, all three short stories. Each one of them has won either the Derringer or the Shame of uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, not Shame, the, the, the Thriller Award. Uh, the Gospel According to Gordon, Gordon Black won the Derringer Award in, uh, in 2008, as did uh, Paper Walls, Glass Houses for quite a while until John Floyd did the same thing. And by the way, John Floyd's a wonderful writer. I'm very pleased to be in a very small club with him. But uh, up until he did it a couple of years ago, uh, for years, I was the only person who'd ever won Derringer Awards in two different categories in the same year. And it was for these two, uh, whoops, uh, it was these two, um, the gods uh, or the god i'm sorry wrong the god uh, the gospel according to gordon black and paper walls glass houses and then in 2011 i was very privileged to win the thrill itw thriller award for best short story for the gods for vengeance cry well we have all three of these now uh and they are bound glossy bound and they will be signed and we're having a little uh uh, a little uh, raffle here, not a raffle, it's more like a, a drawing. Uh, send me an email to my uh, my author address, which is uh, writerrickhelms at uh, aol.com. 
and uh, and just put contest entry in the top line. And uh, uh, I think it's February the 9th, I think. Uh, uh, in there. March. Oh, no, I'm sorry, March the 9th. March the 9th. We're March. in February now, aren't we? Uh, but it'll be March the 9th, I think. Six, I think. I think it was March 6th. Okay. I'll draw a name from uh, at random from the group of people who send entries, and I will send that individual all three short stories signed. It's almost 30,000 words of pleasurable reading uh, that you'll cool. get if you're uh, sending an email. All right. Well, Rick, it was really great having you on today. Thank you so much. Well, I'm very happy to be here, and, I'm, and I appreciate you having me. Uh, people can very quickly actually read part of the new book in progress because my students <laughs> are <laughs> so, so I'll hide that. I don't, I don't want to give <laughs> away the thrilling ending to the book. But thank you very much for having me today, Debbie. And, and It was I, my pleasure. I, uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you again at one of the cons down the road. Yeah, hopefully soon. <laughs> and uh, to everyone out there, uh, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to check out the Crime Cafe uh, publications as well on my website, debbiemack.com. And I will talk to you in two weeks. Happy reading until then.